Hello everybody, welcome back. Today I'm going to be talking about the third film in the VHS franchise, that is of course 2014's VHS Viral. Just some quick things I want to go over before we get into the actual review. So first off, uh, we won't be using any uh, film footage for this one again, but as I mentioned in the second review, this is more of an audio experience. The way I really kind of consume these type of videos is I usually just have them on in the background while I'm playing a video game or something, and that's kind of how I uh, it's kind of how I intend this to be presented. So there, you know, there may be some visual aids or whatever, but you can uh, safely put it on in the background and not have to worry about looking at the screen. Secondly, this one does get pretty, uh, shall we say, hot and heavy as opposed to the second and first film, so uh, it might get a little juicy. And if that's uh, not your bag of tea, I don't blame you. Uh, feel free to uh, duck out. Thirdly, I'd also like to mention that there will, of course, be spoilers in this. I feel this movie should be enjoyed first before listening to this. We got a real banger on our hands, folks, and I feel it would be a shame to, uh, you know, have some of the twists and turns spoiled for you ahead of time. Not counting the framing narratives, VHS 1 had five segments, VHS 2 had four, and VHS 3 has three. That means each segment really feels developed this time around, and I have to spoil my own review here, but let me just say, there is no lemon this time. Each segment really delivers, but if you've seen the film before or you don't mind spoilers, then let's proceed to our framing narrative. This time, our framing narrative is titled Vicious Circles and is directed by Marcel Sarmiento. The only other film of his I can comment on is 2008's Dead Girl. It's a film with an extremely dark and unsettling premise. As for the film itself, though, I haven't seen it in so long, I can't really remember my opinion on it. All I remember is that I had kind of mixed emotions about the whole ordeal, but I can't remember specifically why, though it is a really messed up premise, and, uh, you know, it's definitely not for everyone. Uh, this was also co-written by TJ Simfel, David White, and also Marcel Sarmiento. Those other two names, TJ Simfel and David White, don't really mean anything to me. Our story starts out with several bits of footage consisting of a man named Kevin filming his girlfriend Iris. Uh, we get the impression that the two are in love. The two have a sweet moment on a bridge overlooking a dried-up riverbed, and we also get other various shots of the two interacting, though it appears that Kevin has some kind of obsession with filming things, uh, not always with his girlfriend's express consent. Skipping ahead a little bit, the two are sitting on a couch watching the news when it seems an ice cream truck is engaged in a high-speed chase with the cops. Kevin realizes that this is happening right near where they live, and he wants to go outside and film it. I guess he thinks if it goes viral, he'll become famous or something? I don't know. So anyways, he goes outside, and when he's outside, a jerk cop appears and tells him he has to go back inside, it's dangerous, he can't be filming, yada yada yada. Back inside, Iris gets a call on her phone, uh, she answers it, and immediately a sort of blank expression takes over her face. We cut back to Kevin is still arguing with the jerk cop, and he sees Iris leave the house. She seems oblivious to Kevin trying to get her attention and walks across the street. At the same time, the ice cream truck speeds by and runs over the policeman. His arm goes flying at the screen in a weird sort of moment where I wonder if maybe it was meant to be in 3D or something, though I have no evidence that this film was ever intended to be in 3D. It's just a strange moment. And uh, he realizes that Iris is now gone. This is the point where the first segment of the movie would begin. However, the way I do things around here is I cover the entire framing narrative first and then get to the story bits. So once we cut back from where the first story segment would be, we then cut back to Kevin on a bike. He is chasing after the ice cream truck van thing. He attempts to like FaceTime her, I guess, or video call her. I don't know. That wouldn't be my go-to thing if I was trying to communicate with someone in an emergency i'd probably just do a regular phone call but whatever so he video calls her she answers and tells him that he has to come help her or, you know she's scared as her call cuts out we get a little bit of video interference or static or something on his phone we do see two stills one of which being the weird girl from amateur hour from vhs1 and father from safe haven and vhs2 two awesome callbacks to two of the best segments in the VHS series. 
we learn that it is not just Kevin and Iris being affected by what's going on as we do see random stranger answer his phone and his nose starts to bleed and he gets a sort of slack jawed expression, a gaggle of random civilians watch on. One of them climbs atop a bridge to try to get a better view with his camera, saying that he's going to be famous on YouTube shortly before he plummets to his death. All while Kevin and some other men, I guess, on bikes, as well as the jerk cops, chase the van. The men pull Kevin aside and tell him that he's messing up their video. He tries to explain to them that he's trying to rescue his girlfriend and that he thinks he knows what the van is doing. I don't really get that part. But, uh, so anyways, as they're discussing this, the van drives by and, like, hits one of the guys, and that he's not really, like, hit. He's now, like, dangling from the back of the van, and he also was apparently wearing a GoPro, and, like, you can, like, see, like, the footage from his GoPro of, like, a weird hand grabbing him, like, a monster-looking hand from inside the van holding him. Anyways, this guy, he's, like, being dragged... It causes a big problem because, like, his legs kind of fall off from being dragged against the road as by the speeding van, and uh, it causes a big old pile up. Then we get a very bizarre digression to the main plot where uh, some uh, vatos, as we'll call them, I guess, are having a cookout in their backyard, and they're just, you know, the most... Uh, shall we say, um, uh, they're very Latino stereotypes. They're very much just, uh, like, the most stereotypical Latino gangster people you'll ever see in a movie. So, like, the police helicopter flies over their house because it's chasing that van, and I guess the people at the cookout assume that the police are after them, which causes everyone to freak out and start killing each other. And then, finally, it's just, like, one dude, one bad hombre left, and he, uh, he just blows himself up with, uh, the gas from the barbecue, which causes, like, a huge, like, massive explosion, giant fireball that destroys, like, a city block. It's a little ridiculous. Yeah, I just want to say, like, that part is really weird, and doesn't really, like, jive with the rest of the movie. I don't know, it's just weird. It's just weird. I don't... This whole, it, it, like, and I didn't really, like, explain it very well, this part, because it's stupid, but, like, there's a very slapsticky kind of tone to this whole scene, which just is completely out of place with the rest of the framing narrative segment. And I guess, like, the only real relevance of it is to kind of, like, explain that the signal or whatever that's causing people to go cuckoo is like causing all kinds of mayhem and now the city itself is in trouble because now there's like big fires spreading and such i i don't know i i don't like this part so i'm just going to continue so when we cut back to like kevin's story we get like a quick scene of him chasing a cab but the cab ignores him and just keeps driving so we get this kind of like weird self-contained vignette similar to the last part where this time it's about a man and a woman in a taxi cab. Guy, he's uh, giving the woman some instructions. Uh, it becomes pretty obvious that they're filming some kind of sleazy, nasty porno in the cab. And the lady in the film, she uh, keeps kind of asking the uh, porno guy if he recognizes her. And dude is like, nah, I don't. Uh, I do this a lot. And then she pulls out a gun and is like, now do you remember me? And he's like, oh yeah, you're that lady who I published a revenge porn film of. And then she's like, yeah, you did that. And he's like, but I didn't make it. I just hosted it on my website. And then she's like, I'm going to shoot your balls off. And then a struggle ensues for the gun. And then as they're... He's kind of strangling her. You can see from the front seat, from like the windshield view, that a car is heading straight to them. And then they get into a car crash and it cuts out. At least like the part with like the Latino cookout kind of implied that like, oh, hey, there's something bigger going on in the city. Madness is uh, taking over and people are acting completely irrationally. And now there's fires everywhere. I guess like the segment, the segment doesn't count for that because... Theoretically, this woman was planning this revenge scheme against the, the porno guy before the the pulse signal that's making everyone act all cuckoo. 
happened. I guess maybe, like, the car accident was caused by a bad driver who got, you know, cell phone always on that damn phone into a zombie or something. I don't know. Uh, don't like this part either. It's, uh, it's bad. So, uh, to conclude the story of Kevin, Kevin follows the van to, like, this, like, dried up river tunnel thing that appeared in the beginning of the segment. He finds the van, it parked, he walks up to the ice cream truck slash van, and walks around to the front and sees that there's no driver, but there's, like, a pair of severed hands duct taped to the wheel. Uh, it's kind of spooky, weird, I guess. Oh, severed hands, oh, scary. So he walks around to the back of the vehicle and gets inside. Uh, the door is immediately shut behind him. And inside, the setup of old TVs and recording equipment and VHS players, just like we're used to seeing in all our previous VHS films. And uh, then the screen cuts to his girlfriend, and she's talking to him on the TV, and she's telling him he has to... He has to do it, you know, he has to push the, he has to do the thing, and he looks and there's a big old, big old button that says upload on it, and he's like, I don't want to do it, and she's like, okay, and then she like starts like bashing her head against the wall, and she's getting all mussed up, and he's like, no, stop doing it, I'll do it, and he uh, does the thing with the button, and, you know, it uploads the films, I guess, it uploads all the segments we saw on the screen, they're going up on to the YouTubes, I'm guessing. And he leaves the van, and he sees her dead body, and she's got a cell phone in her mouth. And he looks at the cell phone, and then his eyes go all glazed over, and uh, his nose starts to bleed. He's become one of them phone zombies. And then he, uh, the camera pans out, and we see that the city's on fire with rock and roll. And there's a helicopter spinning out of control, and then it's the end. And I gotta say, uh, so I kind of, on my previous reviews, I was a little maybe critical of the first two VHS films for having two overly similar wraparound segments, narr uh, framing narratives, whatever you want to call them. And this film certainly does its best to have a unique framing narrative kind of thing going on. It still doesn't ever really explain too much. Maybe that's for the best. But it's still, I don't know, I, I don't like this. I mean, I like the idea and theory of it, but I think it's executed a little weirdly. I don't like the part with the porno guy, part with Chicanos and the Vatos and the barbecue. I mean, it's like a cool idea and theory, and there's some kind of nice, like, sort of video drone esque moments towards the end. And I'm kind of upset, though, that we never get to see the creature with the monster hands that was holding that guy earlier that's kind of a letdown i don't know maybe that's asking too much just because like it's kind of cool when you see like the monster girl from amateur hour and then father and stuff you know it's just like it's a nice little callback and then it's like maybe the monster you know, something similar will show up that'd be cool if we got a monster at the end no we just got like uh you know stephen king's the cell and that's about it so now we're going to talk about the actual segments of the movie, what we all actually came here to enjoy. Our first segment is Dante the Great, directed and written by Greg Bishop. He would later direct the 2016 film Siren, which is based on the segment Amateur Hour from the first VHS film. I haven't seen yet Siren yet, so I can't comment on it, though I have seen 2008's Dance of the Dead, also directed by him, which I remember as being a pretty run-of-the-mill, but kind of fun, if forgettable, zomedy from that kind of era of uh, Shaun of the Dead knockoffs and such. Uh, so, so anyways, this segment starts out with uh, police interrogation footage between a detective and a woman named Scarlet. Scarlet is a magician's assistant for Dante the Great. And when we get some body cam footage of a SWAT team raiding a theater, outside of which we see the marquee and several posters advertising Dante the Great's show, we cut back to the detective asking Scarlet where she found the tape she brought them. She reveals that Dante had a hidden compartment behind a power box in his dressing room where he keeps a bunch of uh, shady-looking films with the names of his victims on them. We then cut back to footage of Dante being carried out of the theater in handcuffs. He's uh, 
doesn't seem very perturbed by this, though, and he's uh, being rather jovial with the crowd who've gathered to see what's going on. Then we get some documentary-style footage about Dante's background. Seems he was kind of unemployed, shall we say, living in a trailer park with a bunch of, you know, similar folks trying to impress them with crummy card tricks he could barely pull off, when suddenly, one day, without explanation, he came into possession of a magical cloak, which apparently was once held by Harry Houdini, who gave it away after learning of its dark power. We then get some footage of Dante practicing with the cloak, and he's somehow able to actually pull off real magic with it, and that's magic with a K, folks. We're talking real stuff, we're talking levitation, we're talking teleportation, we're talking all kinds of crazy stuff that Chris Angel wishes he could do. But then it turns out that there's a dark side to Dante's power. It seems it requires human sacrifices in order to work. He has to literally feed people to his cloak, his demonic drape. So then we find out how Scarlet met Dante. Uh, she had always wanted to be a magician, so she thought if she studied under him, she could learn some, uh, you know, some tricks or two. But Dante had some ideas of maybe showing her something else if you catch my drift. But our girl Scarlet lets him know that she's got a boyfriend. Or at least she did. Until Dante killed him. We then get a more complete view of Dante's arrest, which culminates in Dante being carried out to the squad car. He then teleports out of the car and somehow handcuffs the policeman to his own car. Meanwhile, the detective asks... Scarlet, how he was able to do all these things, and she tells them that it was magic, real magic, and the detective replies, magic doesn't exist, magic can't exist, and then uh, she like gets uh, teleported right out of her chair, and now she's back at the theater, and then this is where things go a little crazy, so I'm not gonna do a scene by scene, shot by shot, but essentially what happens from then here on out is actually really kind of fun and enjoyable, so you should probably watch it for yourself, but we get a kind of three-way battle between Dante, Scarlet, and the police SWAT team people, and uh, it's pretty, actually, it's pretty, pretty awesome. It's definitely a very unique uh, idea. You don't ever really see this sort of, I can't think of a single movie that's done anything similar off the top of my head to this, where basically the idea is that uh, the SWAT team going in guns blazing, trying to take him out, and he's using, like, magic to take them out, and it's it's pretty entertaining uh, watching a, a dude who's like a dressed like a stereotypical stage magician using, like, kinds of magic-y tricks to take out a guns blazing SWAT team. Meanwhile, also, he's got to deal with Scarlet trying to steal his magical cape away from him and take his font of power. It's great. It's a lot of fun. It's not very scary. The segment's not scary at all, which is weird because this is technically a horror film, but this segment is... It's fun, though. I guess that's kind of better than trying to be scary and not being scary like uh that stupid alien segment at the end of vhs 2 that was what was that Jeez louise but yeah i mean like this like it's a pretty good segment yeah i i like it it's not it's not a like a top five or anything like that but it's it's pretty enjoyable it's it's solid. It's a solid good segment. I I it, and I've I say this all the time in these things, but you know I could kind of see an entire movie out of this segment, and I like it. Yeah. So the ending. Uh. Blah, 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 um. So at the end, the cloak turns on Dante and consumes him. We get a scene of Scarlet burning the cloak in a dumpster. And then we get some shots of people kind of discussing what they think happened to Dante, and no one really knows, because I guess none of the footage that we saw was ever recovered. And then the final shot is, uh, it's, uh, Scarlet, she's on her computer at home, and then, like, her door to her closet kind of, like, rustles or something. So she goes to check it out, and then the cloak is there, hanging from the door, and then... You know, hands pop out and grab her and pull her in. The end. I like it. It's good. That's all I gotta say about this one. It's good. It's good enough. It's better than good enough. 
I won't say it's great, but I like it. Now, before we get to our next segment, I feel I really need to explain a few things. Um, I think that this segment is so good, you really should see the movie before listening to this, if you haven't already. Again, I know I've done spoiler warning before, but this is one of those situations, much like cult segment from the second movie, where you really should experience this before you go in. Secondly, this segment is, it, and pardon my language, it's fucking bonkers. So, explaining it is going to be kind of tricky. So, and once again, if you have not seen it, go see it now before listening. But, if you're okay with spoilers, let's proceed. This segment involves alternate dimensions. The protagonist of our story is named Alfonso. So, when I refer to the protagonist Alfonso, I will be referring to him as Solid Alfonso, or just Solid for short. When I refer to the alternate universe Alfonso, I will refer to him as Liquid Alfonso, or just Liquid for short. Then there's also Alfonso's wife, Marta. So again, original normal universe Alfonso's wife, Marta, is solid Marta. And alternate universe Alfonso's wife is liquid Marta. With that out of the way, let's get to our third segment, which is the aptly titled Parallel Monsters, directed and written by Nacho Vigalondo. And uh, I haven't seen any of this guy's other work. Uh, the only thing that I've even really heard of is a TV show called Our Flag Means Death, which is about pirates, and I hear is pretty good. He directed a couple episodes of that onto the story. Our protagonist, again, is a man by the name of Alfonso. He is a Spanish scientist who is working away in his basement at what looks to be some kind of a... Uh, I'm just going to say it looks like a teleporter kind of thing. If you ever played like a video game or seen a movie before, you can tell right away that this is some kind of teleporty device. His wife wants him to come to bed, but he's busy at work. His wife, again, is by the name of Marta. She seems like a lovely lady, though she's a little fed up with her husband's late night science escapades. Alfonso has a camera set up in his basement to record his activation of his experimental teleporty device. Sure enough, to his surprise, the machine actually works. He manages to create a portal in his basement leading to what seems to be a mirrored version of his own basement. And within that mirror dimension is another Alfonso. The two seem excited to see each other. Though the liquid Alfonso is very excited to cross the threshold to the other dimension, the original solid Alfonso seems a little bit more apprehensive, shall we say. Eventually, though, liquid crosses that threshold into our dimension and giddily suggests that the two experience each other's dimensions for exactly 15 minutes and then meet back in the basement. Solid is a little little shy at first, but he eventually agrees to it and stipulates that Liquid Alfonso not wake his sleeping wife upstairs. Solid crosses the threshold into Liquid's dimension and at first observes that everything seems exactly the same. As he makes his way through the basement and up the basement stairwell, that's when he notices the first discrepancy. A picture hanging on the wall next to the door. It's a different picture than the one that hangs in his dimension. As we see through Liquid's eyes on Solid's dimension, let's just say our dimension, we can see that there is a happy wedding photo hanging from the wall, whereas in Liquid's dimension we see an ominous photo of what seems to be some kind of ritual site lit by candles with a big occult circle on the ground. Solid hears some pornographic moaning sounds coming from behind the door and sheepishly enters the upstairs. He looks around and notices Liquid Marta. His appearance gives her a jump as she wasn't expecting him. Liquid Marta is dressed a little bit more provocatively than Solid Marta was, and it seems that she's getting a bottle of champagne from out of the fridge. Again, remember, she assumes that Solid Alfonso is actually her husband, Liquid Alfonso, so she doesn't have any reason to suspect that he is an extra-dimensional doppelganger. Anyways, after overcoming her shock, she's excited to see him upstairs and assumes that he's come to watch whatever is about to happen in the other room where the moaning is coming from. 
Then she notices the camera in his hand and gets even more excited, assuming he wants to film whatever festivities are about to begin. All the while, Liquid Alfonso silently makes his way through Solid Alfonso's darkened house. Liquid Marta, meanwhile, leads Solid Alfonso onto the deck, where two scantily dressed men are lounging. She pours the two some champagne and introduces them to the man she assumes to be her husband. She asks the two men if it's okay if her husband partakes in what they're about to do, and the two studs say they don't mind. Meanwhile, Liquid Alfonso creeps sneakily, or sneaks creepily, into solid Marta's bedroom where she sleeps soundly. Liquid Marta leads the three men to the living room where we find out where the porno sounds are coming from. They're coming from the TV, which seems to be displaying some kind of torture film, though the sounds don't really seem to be matching up with what's going on on screen. It's it's bizarre. Um, far more importantly, though, uh, we see uh, a weird sort of ramshackle version of what we saw in that photo in the basement set up in the living room where there's a like a, a tarp on the floor and there's some kind of clear plastic bag containing what appears to be viscera of some sort, just bloody chunks of something inside, and the bag is hanging from a metal hook, and around this contraption there's uh, some candles. It's very... it's bizarre. It's this Silent Hillish type of setup, just in the middle of this, you know, upper-middle-class living room. It's... Perhaps that's what's most unsettling about it, honestly. Throughout this whole experience, Solid's been pretty quiet. He's obviously has no idea what's going on and is just kind of rolling with the flow so as to not, you know, rock the boat, shall we say. Meanwhile, Marta, who is sitting in between the two hunky men on a small love seat, apologizes to her assumed husband and offers him a drink and tells him that he should sit down on the couch. She then tells the two hunky men that her husband, he likes to go first in these kind of situations and asks if that's all right with them. They don't seem to mind. They don't seem to mind much, these two. They're they're absolutely just kind of going with the flow. You get the sense that this probably ain't the first uh, rodeo that these two men have been on together, shall we say. It's hard to describe how effective this scene is where solid... Alfonso is expected to perform some, what appears to, it seems like they're asking him to do some kind of sexual act in this moment, and everyone's waiting on him to make the first move because he likes to go first, but solid Alfonso is a good boy from our universe, so he doesn't know what to do. It's uh, someone who has some social anxiety. This is a, this is an absolutely hellish moment where, uh, you're thrust into a situation and expected to do some kind of action, but you don't know what you're supposed to do, and you can't really ask what to do because it's assumed you already know. It's just like, if you strip away the sexual component of it, it's it's absolutely terrifying to someone like me being in a situation like this. Then when you add the bizarre sort of sadomasochistic overtones to the whole thing. It gets even weirder and more unsettling. Meanwhile, back in the normal realm, Liquid Alfonso has now begun taking cell phone pictures of the sleeping Solid Marta. We cut back to Solid Alfonso on the couch. He just, he can't, he can't do it. He doesn't know what to do. He's just frozen in fear and indecision and probably... Pants shitting terror at this moment. I know I certainly would be. As his alternate universe wife and these two hunky men who I guess are there to cuck him just blankly stare at him waiting for him to do something, do anything. After a few moments, the two men, they decide they've had enough. They, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna hit the old dusty trails, which causes Marta to storm off and try to ask them to stay. As he's sitting there just sort of soaking in the absolute horror of the events unfolding around him, a loud blaring sound can be heard from outside which startles him even further. Marta re-enters the room to talk to her 
what she assumes to be her husband, and he can't help but ask about that strange sound. She's perplexed that he doesn't seem to know what that sound is. She then states that it must be because he spends so long in his basement that he forgets that that sound happens this hour during the summer. She tries to have a conversation with him about what happened with the young men in the bag of meat, and all the while, he is just so fixated on this increasingly loud sound from outside and the flashing lights that can now be seen through the window that he's barely paying attention to her. Finally, having had enough, he bolts out the door. We see a massive zeppelin flying overhead on it, a giant upside-down neon cross is lit. What sounds like demonic chanting can be heard at playing over loudspeakers. Standing in the street, he looks over and he sees the two men from before. They're standing outside, talking. They notice him and ask him if everything is alright. Meanwhile, we cut back to Liquid Alfonso. He's, uh, it seems he's had enough of just taking pictures of Solid Marta sleeping. And he starts to, uh, rub his, uh, groinular region with his hand over his pants. Ugh. Cut back to Solid Alfonso. The two men approach him and ask if he's come to welcome them back inside. He says no, and the two become frustrated and demand to know why he's still filming them. This is when things go bonkers. Uh, the two men, the two uh, hunky men, as well as Liquid Alfonso, their heads begin to glow. Now, when I say their heads begin to glow, I mean it's almost like as if the light is coming from within inside their head. It's actually a pretty neat effect. It's like if you put a light bulb in your mouth and turned it on, your the outside of your like your skin wouldn't be glowing, but you'd be able to see like a glow coming from inside from like the softer parts of the flesh. Like it would permeate through like your nostrils and your eyeballs and your lips and stuff. That's the kind of glow. It actually looks like I said it's it's pretty pretty cool effect. The men chase Solid Alfonso and have him cornered against a tree. One of the men begins to lower his pants. Then we cut back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. As we see Liquid Alfonso also begin to drop trow. I know I said it before that this is when things got a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but this is when things escalate even further to unparalleled levels. I don't know how to say this without it sounding comedic, but their penises are demons. Penises are demons. You heard me right. We got dick demons. We got, uh, there are a bunch of snake things hanging from their, hanging from between their legs. They got, looks like the, the tongue creature from the tremor worms. Like they had those little, like, tongue monsters. Yeah, they got those instead of Johnson's. It's pretty wild. As the demonic dude and his prehensile penor approach our protagonist, he pulls out a screwdriver and skewers the... Uh, I don't even know which word I should alliterate that with. But yeah, he stabs the dude in the, in the dong demon. And he uh, he's like, ah, and then he makes his escape back to the house. He tries to make his way back to the basement, but is stopped by Liquid Marta. She sees blood all over him and gets excited. She sees the camera and asks him about the screams. She assumes that he must have gone and had a little fun on his own without her and must have filmed it as a little present for her. All is forgiven, I guess, in this house. So, she begins to disrobe, revealing that her entire, like... From, like, from taint to rib cage is a giant gaping maw of fangs. It's, uh, it's vagina dentata. I've already used the phrase unprecedented level, but again, on an unprecedented level, this is, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty wild, pretty, pretty out there stuff, folks. But our boy Solid, he just wants to get home to our normal vanilla dimension and see his normal vanilla wife. So he socks that succubus in her suck hole. I'm, I apologize for that. There's, that was uncalled for. 
But yeah, he punches her in her face, which gives him the opportunity he needs to get past her and get into the basement. As he crosses the threshold back into our home dimension, he sees Liquid stumble into view. Liquid's covered in blood and wounds. Solid demands to know what he did with Marta, and the two have a battle. Liquid manages to get the upper hand, though, and stabs Solid. As Solid lays bleeding on the floor, Liquid stumbles back into his home dimension. His wife appears, her face now glowing. Again, she has no reason to know anything about alternate dimensions, and assumes that all the events that just transpired were by her husband, the Liquid Alfonso. So she thinks that he's the one who punched her in the face. Liquid Alfonso pleads with her, but she tells him that she's going to carry out the sentence for domestic abuse and uh, shoves his face into her giant vagina mouth, which chomps on his head. Solid sees this and closes the dimensional door. As he stumbles off the ground, he calls out for his dear wife, Marta. We see her enter the frame from outside she's got a kitchen knife in her hand and she is covered in blood she sees solid and assumes that he is in fact the dick demon liquid because she has no reason not to assume that and as he asks her for help she begins to violently stab him in the chest repeatedly as the camera cuts out the end i gotta say man this segment is bonkers we're in wacky territory of this one and i love it we could do an entire movie with this i know i say that on every segment but i really feel like this could be its own entire thing i just love this idea that there's an alternate parallel universe where everyone is like satan worshiping demon people but otherwise live assuming i'm assuming mundane lives much similar to like the normal world that's just an such an intriguing idea you know what i mean and just like it's just so it, it it toys with a lot of ideas that i also enjoy for other reasons like a you know like the idea of a parallel self uh confusing who is who all that kind of like weird stuff like i don't know it's it's it it creates a lot of fun scenarios in your head you know like what would you do in that kind of situation? Let me know down in the comments. Um, it's it's just so oh, I can't I can't really describe it adequately enough. But I gotta say this is definitely top three segment kind of things. This is like when we when I do my eventual uh, tier list, I'm gonna do maybe like a ranking thing. This is definitely top three. We got we got your amateur hour, we got your safe haven, and then we got your um, parallel monsters. There you go, baby. That's top three VHS segments. And it's kind of nice that each film so far, VHS 1, 2, and Viral, have all had one segment that's in that top three tier. I think I can say pretty firmly that this is number three. I can kind of go back and forth on Safe Haven and uh, Amateur Hour, which of those two is better than the other. But this, I think, I think this is a pretty solid number three. It's a great... Great segment. Now we gotta talk about the third segment. Our final segment of tonight is Bone Storm. This one is written by Justin Benson and co-directed with him and Aaron Scott Moorhead of their other work. I have possibly seen 2017's The Endless. Though, for whatever reason, I can't really remember anything about the film. Truth be told, I think I may have either shut it off partway through or fallen asleep. Because I remember, like, how it begins, but I don't remember anything else about it. And I don't remember being particularly impressed with it. Uh, let that not be a prediction of this segment, though. Because I actually, spoiler alert for my review, but I, I kind of like this one. Uh, I'll get into it. So, our story begins with two skate punks and their hired cameraman. They're going around making skate films, though it seems that the cameraman is actually kind of conspiring against the two uh, to see them either get brutally injured or killed performing stunts. 
you kind of, to some degree, maybe you can't blame him a little bit, because we kind of find out these two, you know, they're not exactly the best human beings, shall we say? So after getting kicked out of pretty much every place by jerk cops, the two are hanging out in a skate park, uh, they're, you know, smoking the weeds and shooting guns and just, you know, drinking beers or whatever. I don't know. They're doing stuff kids shouldn't be doing. They're not, they're not in, they're break, they're lawbreakers, TM. So they, uh, you know, they're sitting around thinking about what they're going to do because they hired this cameraman to film them make videos and now they can't film anywhere until they see another kid walking down the street and they're like, hey, kid. What's up? And then this kid's like, hey, I know a place down in Tijuana that's pretty cool. And they're like, I don't know, dude, you sure? And they're like, yeah, man, let's, let's go down there. So then they go down to Tijuana, and they proceed to, uh, you know, fuck shit up, shall we say. they letting off fireworks in buildings, they're drinking cervezas, they're making us gringos look bad in front of the nice people of Mexico. Also, I haven't mentioned it, but uh, it's Días de los Muertos, or as us uh, honkies like to say, Day of the Dead. And I ain't talking about the 1985 George A. Romero masterpiece. I'm talking about the Mexican Day of the Dead. The What I learned in school is their version of Halloween. So as the group decide to go to their actual intended destination, which I forgot to mention is some kind of abandoned irrigation ditch or something? I don't know. Uh, as they get ready to go there, they cross paths with a spooky looking woman who's ominously foreshadowing ominous foreshadowment. The group make it to their destination, which is some kind of uh, concrete thing that looks perfect as a skate park, except for all the bizarre occult accoutrement that seem to be randomly dispersed around, as well as a giant offering circle with uh, some feces and dead animals and all kinds of griblies all around it. The group gets some filming done, they get some sick tricks on their wheelie boards, they do some oolies and some... Uh, grinds as the, I don't know, I haven't watched Rocket Power in a couple, in like 20 years, so I can't, I look, I played Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 about a week ago, and I sucked at it. All I know is that if you press triangle, you can do a grind, and that's about the extent of my ability in that game. Though I do love that song Superman by Goldfinger. Anywho. Their uh, skateboarding stuff is interrupted by the appearance of the creepy cult lady and some of her friends who just kind of stand around silently, except for one dude who's, like, chanting. And he's pretty spooky. Camera guy goes up to the creepy lady and offers to introduce himself and says that, you know, he's a filmmaker. He would love to have her in some movies of his, and he offers her a hand in friendship. She responds by ripping his arm clean off. That's the moment in this segment where things get crazy. That's when this segment becomes not a horror segment, but rather a pretty neat action kind of thing. It's like a horror action segment, I guess you would say. It's kind of similar to the first segment with Dante the Great, where it wasn't really scary at any point. It's got some pretty cool horror-themed fight scenes. This more so is more action oriented than the first segment, I should say, because the characters in this are barely characters. I don't even remember their names. All I remember is that uh, Camera Guy was called Camera Guy and that the other guy was called Gas Money Kid. Those two get taken out pretty quick, so all we're really left with is the two skateboarders. I don't remember their names, but it wouldn't really be worth it to explain scene by scene what happens from here on out because it would just be like and then he shot the guy and then that and then he stabbed him with the sword and then uh it, it would just get weird and dumb and confusing so basically what happens is uh this cult it looks like they're trying to summon some kind of ancient god or something that's underneath the tunnels and they need sacrifices so they try to kill the people 
Uh, they do succeed in killing a gas money kid. But the skateboarder kids, they put up more of a fight. They're able to use their skateboards as well as one of them having a gun to fight off the cultists. You get some really cool shots of like first person skateboarding mixed with gunplay. It's this is the only movie I can think of where you get a first person segment of someone on a skateboard shooting Mexican cultists. This culminates in one of the skateboard kids taking out the the chanting cultists. This seems to cause a change in the atmosphere as the cultists now become more aggressive Whereas before they were just kind of slowly approaching in a creepy manner, they're now actively mad. And furthermore, that causes some rumblings under the ground and for the dead to begin to rise. So now we have not only living cultists, but zombies and skeletons. And with the crew running low on weaponry, they now have to use fists and skateboards over the head and uh, some, you know good old-fashioned fireworks that they bought to blow up some skellymans. It's a lot of fun, the segment. It's got some cool action sequences, and unlike the last one, which had kind of a downer ending, this one actually has a pretty surprisingly kind of upbeat ending, where the, the two skateboard kids, even though they're not that great of people, they do manage to escape, and they kind of lament on the fate of their friends, Gas Money Kid and Camera Guy, even though Camera Guy was also kind of a bad person. Though Gas Money Kid definitely didn't deserve that. The final scene is pretty out there. It's, uh, we see from Camera Guy's camera perspective as he's, I'm not sure if he's dead or not, but he's definitely incapacitated, laying on the ground, bleeding out. Anyways, we can sort of see a giant creature come out of the ground and it picks him up and eats him. We don't really get a good view of the creature, but we do get some first-person vor. First-person vor. As he's swallowed whole and the camera goes down the gullet before we're cutting out. So that's the third um, final segment. Again, the segments in this one are a lot longer than the previous ones because there's only three. Though I should mention there was apparently a fourth segment intended for this film that was cut and was included in the DVD and Blu-ray release for this film, which I do not have. I've only ever watched this film streaming, so I can't comment on that fourth segment. Apparently it was cut because the tone was off as well as it literally not being found footage, which kind of is one of the big gimmicks of the series, so it wouldn't make sense for there to be a 100% non-found footage segment. But hey, maybe sometime I will get my hands on a copy of a DVD or Blu-ray of this film and watch it and then incorporate it into something. But anyways, so that's the three segments and narrative framing segment for VHS Three or VHS viral, I should say. Overall, my opinion of this film is that this is the most enjoyable one to watch. It's definitely the least scary, which is kind of a bummer, but it's the most fun to watch, and I like to have fun with my movies. This film also doesn't really have any clunkers. There's no one segment I can point at and say, that is bad. I don't like this one. The closest thing I can come to that is the sort of mini vignettes within the framing narrative, Latino, Block Party, and the, the porno cab, but those are pretty short and I don't think really qualify as segments, so those get a pass. So in terms of consistency, this is the most consistently quality film of the series, and that's, I'm gonna spoil my review for four and just say 4 doesn't hold a candle to this one. I haven't really looked into reviews. I know I probably should. Some content creators who I really enjoy kind of do that, where they incorporate other reviews into their reviews and sort of, uh, you know, give their commentary on other people's views of the film. I don't really want to do that. But what little I have seen of discussion of this film, it seems like a lot of people didn't like the tone of it and felt it didn't match the tone of the others in the series. And I gotta say, like, as someone who this is, spoiler alert, their favorite film in the series, I, I kind of understand and I kind of don't. I mean, like, I get that this one is the least scary, and ostensibly this is a horror film series, but when it's this fun, it's hard to 
object to it. You know what I mean? Especially when, like, the previous two films before this one, they had their quality segments for sure, but they also had some real duds. And, like, that awful alien segment or second honeymoon or just, like, things that were supposed to be scary but weren't due to varying degrees of technical capability like the really lame looking alien baby in the first movie or the ghost people from the eyeball segment in two i don't know it's this one feels consistent you know what i mean it feels cohesive not just in terms of quality but also in terms of tone and theme the other three films in the main series they are just a collection of vignettes with a framing narrative linking them there's no real commonality between the segments other than that they are in the found footage format and that they are horror related this film however i feel there is more linking them and i'll explain that while not directly linked in terms of plot or characters there is a common theme of of seeking attention or fame or wealth through film what I mean by that is, in the framing narrative, it's obviously, it's spelled out that Kevin wants to make it big on YouTube. He thinks that filming this ice cream truck driving around is going to somehow make him famous and rich. We see that, again, with the guy who goes to film the video but gets knocked off the bridge and falls to his death, or the bikers who are trying to film it with their cameras as well. All these people who get hurt and killed in the pursuit of internet stardom. We get a similar theme again in the first segment where you have Dante who wants to strike it big as a famous magician. He could just get a normal job, but instead he has to do this dangerous job of being a magician. And again, it sort of leads to his downfall as videotapes are what ultimately bring the cops to his attention and unravel his whole scheme. I'd argue that this link is most tenuous with the second segment. My only kind of mm, connection here would be that Alfonso is filming his experimentation in the hopes that, you know, this will bring him fame and fortune. And it's a little tenuous there, but it's most heavily featured as a pretty big prominent part of the story in Bone Storm, where the cameraman is outright plotting against his subjects to get them hurt or killed. It ends up backfiring on him, and he suffers for it. It seems like an overarching theme is sort of that seeking this stardom is going to corrupt or destroy you. I don't know. Maybe I'm just overthinking it and just trying to pad out the video. Either way, I really, really love VHS Viral. I strongly recommend you go out and watch it. Um, I thank you for listening to this. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring the bell and leave a comment. Add me on MySpace, on Friendster, on LiveJournal. No, just kidding. I don't have any of those. But, yeah, um, that's all for today. I love you very much. And stay tuned for my VHS4 review uh, coming in probably in two weeks or so. I don't know. That one is kind of bad. It's not, well, I shouldn't say bad, but that kind of spoils it. But it's going to take a little bit of motivation to get me to do that one. We'll see. Thank you for listening. Bye.